Hello everyone and welcome back to Banjo Tooie on the Nintendo 64. I am One Wild Sheep yet again, and today, ladies and gentlemen, we meet up with Humba Wumba here for the very first time, who is this game's transformation shaman. She basically replaces Mumbo Jumbo's functions from the original game, because obviously now we get to play as Mumbo. So, uh, you know, she she basically transforms us into various animals of varying nature, and pretty much every transformation in this game is. You know what, I'm gonna say, it's probably every transformation in this game is better than every transformation from the first game. This is something they greatly, greatly improved upon. The transformations have more to do with each of the levels, they have, uh, they have more abilities. I think pretty much every single transformation is, uh, has some sort of means to attack enemies, which uh, is something that can't really be said for the original Banjo-Kazooie game. But anyway, we go to her with, um, with one of them global creatures whenever we need to transform. And uh, we basically transform to do specific tasks. For example, we had to transform into this stony. Why? Because stonies can talk to these stone like creatures who are also called stonies. And we can also use this transformation in order to access a football arena that we actually kind of glanced upon earlier on. Where uh, we tried to walk in and the big bad um, bouncer guy was all like, Yo, you're, you're not a stony, you can't play. What are you, stupid? So, uh. Yeah, we had to transform into the stony in order to do that. We have to transform into the stony to gain access to a mini game, which I'll talk about in a bit. But before we head over to the mini game sequence, we are going to go into the prison compound area over yonder because, well, there is a bit of a, um, it's a bit of an overarching quest going on by here because uh, this mission that I'm about to access, I'm not going to be able to complete until the second world of the game because we need enough power in the second world. But uh, I figured for speed reasons, I'm going to go and do it right now. Basically, as soon as you walk into this area, you must talk to this stony by here and pay attention to what he says. He'll give you a, he'll basically give you an order on what to press up a number of switches in. Basically, for me right now, it's sun, star, moon, star, sun, or something like that. So. Uh, Basically, memorize what he memorize what he told you to press, and uh, just basically press them, and he will open up this fantastic-looking Ma Mayan building here, this Aztec-looking building. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a there's a rat in here. Me, Dilberta, was out looking for gold when a boulder fell down to trap me in here. I suppose you expect us to move it. I don't know what the fuck voice I'm doing, sorry. But yeah, basically we need to break away the boulder that's in the compound in order to um into in order to free Delberta and send her home, which unfortunately we cannot do just yet. Because uh that is actually something we're gonna be utilizing a brand new move in order to fully access. What can I tell ya? And using those warp pads that are also littered throughout the levels as well, I would advise warping back to the very beginning of the stage in order to get that honeycomb piece, because why not? It's there, it's easy to obtain, you might as well catch it, you know, folks. I don't think I really need to say this as well, but all your moves such as uh, the... The, I forget what it's called. All your moves that you have with uh, Kazooie are basically disabled when you're in transform, your transform state. So you can't fly, you can't do anything of that nature, which it's common sense, but you know, I figured I may as well point it out because some people may not realize that, you know, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, walk on back up to the stadium here and the guy will let us in because obviously we're now Banjo the Stony. We're not Banjo the Baron Bird, you know, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, there's that. We just we're just sort of lucky there was a shortage of players. So this guy's just gonna be all, oh yeah, okay, you might as well go in anyway. So I uh, thank you, Mr. Uno Gopez or whatever the hell your name is. It's time for us to duel. Unfortunately, we're not playing duel masters. This isn't Yu-Gi-Oh. We're gonna be uh, instead we're gonna be playing some footy, some classic soccer football. You know, ladies and gentlemen, so just chat to the Stony and you will open up one of the three gates. Basically, these are mini games. These are littered throughout the course of the entire game. Banjo Tooie is a hell of a lot more varied compared to its original game. There's a lot more going on in terms of areas to explore, obviously, but there's a lot more going on in terms of there's multiple ways they try to break up the gameplay with mini games, and I love this because when they chuck a mini game at you, it's usually when you're about to get sick of the normal gameplay, and it, you, it's it's a nice diversion, you know, ladies and gentlemen. The only thing that kind of bugs me a little bit is sometimes these mini games can be really picky to complete, especially one specific first person shooter sequence way later on in the game, but I'll I'll be talking about that when I get to it. What can I tell ya? What can I tell ya? Indeed. Hmm, yes. 
But basically, yeah, this is just the football, except it works by, uh, it works on different rules of football, because instead of knocking, uh, balls into enemy goals, you need to knock the balls into your own goal in order to gain your score, and the one with the highest score at the end of the round wins. That's basically all there is to it. There is a more traditional version of this later down the line in the game, where you have to get the lowest score to win, but, uh... I don't know, I, I, I'll talk more about that when we get to that, that's way later in the game. Right now we just need to basically kick the balls into our own goals and for the most part ignore the other players because the other players are just sitting there, they're going to get in your way, they're going to be a pain in the ass. just ignore them, trust me on that, otherwise otherwise you will probably have trouble with this because those other players are what causes this to be difficult. If you focus too much on them, you're not getting balls in your goal. If you're not getting balls in your goal, then you're not getting points. If you're not getting points, you sir are going to lose. What can I tell you? That is just mean good sir. My shorts are pretty dope. You liar. <laughs> But anyway, now uh, round two is basically exactly the same, although the difference is this time around is we have been introduced to red balls. Basically, if you kick a red ball into a goal, it will take down one point. So uh, basically, kick the yellow balls into the goal for two points, and then kick the red ball into a goal in order to remove one point. And honestly, I usually try to avoid grabbing the red balls unless they are within my path because, uh, you know, they're, they're just, it's just less time collecting points for yourself, you know, folks, so... Usually what I sort of advise is just grab the yellow balls and ignore the red ones unless they are in your direct path or unless you reckon one of the enemy teams are gonna grab and kick into your goal, you know, ladies and gentlemen. But, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's an easy little thing, it's an easy little fun side distraction, what can I tells ya? What can I tells ya? Indeed. Of course, this game does run on the rule of three, so obviously we do need to beat this a third time. Now, not every mini game in this game you need to beat three times in order to fully complete. There's only certain ones you need to beat multiple times. The majority of the mini games in this game, you basically you beat once, and then that's it. You you beat the mini game, get the jiggy, move on. It's so. This is one of the outlier mini games in regards to that. But uh, anyway, for the third stage of this. Football mayhem, if you will, because <laughs> it's mayhem temple getter. Uh, they've introduced bomb balls. Basically, bomb balls. If you kick bomb ball and it touches you or an enemy, it will explode. If it explodes, it will stun you or the enemy for a set period of time, which uh, can either be used to your advantage if you really need the help. But usually, I just like at last round avoid the the blast balls. Avoid the bombs. They Usually the enemies themselves will blow themselves up before you have a chance of even doing anything to them with the bomb balls. There's only one or two rare instances like there where uh, using the bomb itself is very useful, you know, ladies and gentlemen, so just ignore it. Just keep kicking into the golds and uh, you should be getting through this without too much of an issue. It is the first mini game of the game, you know, ladies and gentlemen, so it's going to be pretty easy. It's not going to give you the most challenging thing at the get-go, is it? That would be bad game design. And of course, this is Rareware. They don't make bad games. They make games with sometimes questionable things, but they, they don't make flat out bad games, you know? Their games are all pretty dope. They're all pretty high in quality. Ignoring the obvious Kinect games, of course, because, you know, Kinect sports and whatnot. Yeah. Horrible games. <laughs> Anything involved in the Kinect is horrible. I don't care what, what game it is. It, I don't like the Kinect. It's like the worst thing ever. Honestly, it, it, it's, it, it's like... I don't think I owned a single game on the Kinect that works. I think the closest game I own to working is Sonic Free Riders, and even then I spent the entire game flailing my arms going, Hey, I think I'm doing it right. Sort of tilting and they would not turn properly. It, uh, the Kinect's a pain in the ass. It's horrible. I don't like it. I don't know what made them think it was a good idea, but... Uh, I digress, that is the end of that minigame for now, ladies and gentlemen, what can I tells ya? What can I tells ya, indeed. Mmm, yes. But, uh, one thing that is quite awesome about this, this particular world is that, uh, we are gonna be gaining a new power in this world that is gonna be prevalent during the course of the entire game. And, obviously I'm talking about a power that's different from my, uh, first person aim power that I mentioned previously. Uh, it's a, it's a first-person shooter sort of uh, power, which we use in very specific areas. Like I mentioned, there's first-person shooter sequences earlier on. Um, I won't be talking too much about that until we actually get to the first-person shooter sequence, which I don't think will be in this part. It might be either the next part or the part after, but uh, trust me, there's first-person shooter golden eye sequences to deal with. 
but um, yeah, using the flight pad, we can now access the t the top of that tower that opened up when we talked to the guy who wanted uh, targets and bloody golden thingy what's it. So uh, we're basically going up there and going through here. And this is something that's kind of interesting, folks, because uh, we're no longer in World One. You might be sitting there going, what? No, we're in World 5, I believe now, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Dactyland. This is what I was on about when the game itself is... It's more of a unified world in comparison to Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Kazooie, every world was its own isolated case. In this game, the worlds are linked together in ways that make sense and... Well, basically, you can basically get from any world to any world. With ease, you know, ladies and gentlemen. For example, if I want to go to World 5, I could just take that way. And you would ask the question, can you actually explore World 5 properly right now? No, you can't. They were, they were smart enough to lock you off from exploring the full world. Because, uh, obviously, this is quite a far into the game level. But, um... Basically, you can... You, Basically, you can visit worlds of different areas and whatnot, and the world's interconnected. And I love that about Banjo Tui. It doesn't feel like it's uh, a video gamey thing where you go into pocketed dimensions. It feels like a full blown, breathing, living world, and I love that. You know, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it does cause a lot of backtracking issues every now and then because obviously, what's the point of having everything interconnected if you're not going to use the interconnected pathways? But, um,. You know, honestly, I don't mind the backtracking too much in this game because they do a good job in rectifying a lot of the issues with backtracking. Now, I don't like backtracking when it's not clear that I have to backtrack. Like, there's one or two particular jiggies. That... Basically, the game's not very clear on certain jiggies that you can't get until later down the line, you know, ladies and gentlemen. So, your first time playing through the game will be just trying to collect as much as you can without going into the 100% mentality. Because... If you're playing this game with a 100% I'm gonna complete everything mentality on your first run through, you will be stressed out. Because the game isn't designed for um, being beaten one run in the traditional sense on your first time playing. It's designed to be explored, constantly replayed, learning everything until you are able to beat it in one run. Like I'm doing here, you know, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, you know, it, it can it's very frustrating your first time through and I'm not honestly not too big a fond of uh, backtracking in that regard, but... You know, I, in general, I don't mind the backtracking as much as a lot of other people do, you know, it's it's annoying, but it gives the world an excuse to be interconnected, and honestly, I think that could be a good enough um, excuse, you know? But then again, I'm just talking bullshit right now for the sake of commentary, so who knows, but... Uh, yeah, we'll be revisiting that Unga Bunga cave there much, much later on in the playthrough, probably, and... That's probably roughly the halfway point, maybe past the halfway point we'll be visiting the level again, so... Yeah, it's gonna be some time until we get to revisit that area, but uh, trust me, we will be going back there, and we will be exploring it in bulk, I can assure you that much. What can I tell ya? What can I tell ya? Indeed! Mm, yes, mm, rather. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, you can use the grip grab ability we picked up earlier on as well to climb on these walls. And I don't think I really mentioned the grip grab ability because I sort of just walked past it. But the grip grab power it allow it basically allows you to hang on ledges, you know, which is kind of handy. But with that, that is it for this part, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you all for watching. Hope you all enjoyed. Don't be sheepish, people. And I'll catch you all again. Bye!